This is the second part of my lecture on probability distributions in which I'm going to be talking about the binomial distribution. The binomial distribution is associated with Jacob Bernoulli. He was a Swiss mathematician born in Baal in Switzerland in 1654. Now his father wanted him to become a minister of the Protestant Church, so he was compelled to study theology at the University of Baal, but much against his father's wishes, he also studied mathematics and astronomy in his spare time. He then travelled widely around Europe, studying mathematics with great names in each country that he visited, and at the age of 33 he was appointed Professor of Mathematics in the University of Baal. Now his brother Johann was also an excellent mathematician, and in fact there was bitter rivalry between the two of them to see who could make the greatest contribution to mathematics. But after Jacob's death in 1705, his brother Johann succeeded him as Professor of Mathematics, so in the end they each had equal honours. Jacob's book The Art of Conjecture was published after his death by his nephew, another mathematician in the Bernoulli family. This book includes Jacob's work on developing the mathematics of probability for games of chance, and that introduced the binomial distribution for the results of trials that can have one of two outcomes, hence the name binomial, two numbers, two probabilities for two different outcomes. So the binomial distribution is a discrete distribution. Um, the results can be positive whole number values only, like our histogram of bone scan values. It shows the probability of success in several independent trials, and these are called Bernoulli trials, after Jacob Bernoulli. And in this context, a trial means a particular attempt. Uh, success is getting the desired result, and independent trials means that one result is not affected by all the others. Some examples of that are tossing a coin, where each trial will be one toss of the coin. Success might be getting a head. Each toss of the coin is independent of the others. The result of getting a head or a tail on this toss isn't affected by whether we got a head or a tail on the previous one, because there's no way the coin can know what happened last time. So they are independent. Likewise, winning at roulette, um, the uh, success is winning your bet. Um, the chance of winning is independent of uh, the previous wins and therefore this constitutes a, a binomial distribution. Likewise, throwing dice. Uh, each throw of the dice is independent of the others and your chance of winning, for example, of getting a six uh, isn't affected by what the dice did before. On the other hand, the binomial distribution doesn't apply to passing the driving test. True, you can have many trials, many attempts to pass. Um, each trial can result in success or failure, but each trial is not independent. If you fail the driving test on one occasion, then you get feedback, which hopefully improves and therefore changes the probability of success at the next test. So the binomial distribution doesn't apply in this case because the trials aren't independent. But throwing dice is a good example of the binomial distribution and in this context a trial is just one throw of one single die and success we can define as getting a six. The probability of success, which we'll call p, is therefore one in six or one sixth. The probability of failure, that is, getting anything other than a 6, we define by Q, and that has to be 5 6, because the total probability of success or failure, 1 6 plus 5 6, has to add up to 1. These trials are indeed independent, because as long as the dice are fair, the result of one throw shouldn't depend on the others. Therefore, it doesn't matter whether you take one die and throw it several times, for several successive trials like that, or take several die and throw them all at once. If the die are independent, throwing them all at once can't affect the result because one die can't influence the others. So let's have a look at th the example of throwing a six with one die. If we throw a single die, then clearly we can get any number between 1 and 6 as a result. If we're just counting 6 as a success, 
then most of the time we get failures. But about one time in six on average we'll get a success. So we've seen there that the number of trials n is 1 because we have one die. The probability of success, p, is 1 in 6 and the probability of failure, q, is 5 in 6. So there are two possible outcomes. We could have a failure that has a probability of 5 in 6. 5 over 6 is 0.83 and that failure clearly doesn't give us any 6s at all. We can have a success. The probability of success is 1 over 6 or 0.17 and that gives us 1 6. Notice that the sum of all those probabilities 0.83 plus 0.17 adds up to 1 as it should. So if we plot the probability distribution for this result we see that the red bar here for 0 6's has a probability of 0.83 and the red bar here for 1.6 has a probability of 0.17. Those are the only results that we can have if we are throwing one die. Notice that the area under this probability histogram does add up to 1. This is the binomial distribution for n, the number of trials, as 1 and p, the probability of success of 0.17. If we look at the distribution, we can characterize it by several parameters. First of all, the mode, the value that occurs most frequently, is zero. The most likely outcome is that we don't get any sixes at all. The mean number of sixes is a sixth or 0.17. So that's the mean of this distribution. And if we work out the variance using the method that we discussed in the last lecture, um, from the histogram data here, you can find that in fact the variance turns out to be 0.14. That means the standard deviation, which is just the square root of the variance, is 0.37. So this is the binomial distribution for n equals 1, characterized by these parameters. Now let's see what happens if we take two dice at the same time. Here n, the number of trials, is 2, but p, the probability of success with one die, is 1 sixth, and q, the probability of failure, is 5 sixths. If we roll two dice, most of the time we don't throw any sixes at all. Sometimes we'll throw a six on the white, and sometimes on the red. If we keep on going long enough, one time in 36, we'll throw two sixes, one on the red and one on the white. So we've seen there that there are four possible outcomes. We could have failure on both dice. We don't get a six on the red or on the white. The probability of failure is 5, 6, so 5, 6 on the red dice and 5, 6 on the white dice. The probability of both of those happening is 5, 6 times 5, 6, which is 0 0.69. That gives us no 6s in our result at all. On the other hand, we could have a failure on the red dice and a success on the white one which be a probability of 5, 6 for the failure on the red and a probability of 1, 6 for the, failure on the, for the success on the white. 5, 6 times 1, 6 is 0 0.14. Likewise, we could have success on the red with a probability of 1, 6, failure on the white with a probability of 5, 6, which also gives us 0 0.14. Those two together give a total of 0 0.14 plus 0 0.14, which is 0 0.28 and both of those result in 1 6 either on the red or the white. The other possibility, possibility is that we are lucky enough to succeed with both the red and the white dice. A probability of 1 6 of success on the red dice 
multiplied by a probability of one sixth of success on the white die gives us a six times one sixth, which is 0 0.03, and that results in two sixes. So our probability distribution looks like this. The probability of getting zero sixes is 0 0.69. The probability of getting one six is 0 0.28 and the probability of getting two sixes is 0 0.03. And once again, all of these probabilities add up to a total of 1.0. So this is the binomial distribution for n, the number of trials equals 2, and a probability of success of 1 sixth or 0 0.17. Once again, we see that the most likely value, the mode, is 0. 0 is the tallest bar in this distribution. That's the most likely outcome, no sixes. The mean number of sixes, if you work it out from this distribution, is 0 0.33 and the variance is 0 0.28. So the standard deviation, which is the square root of the variance, is 0 0.53. So you see this is the binomial distribution for n equals 2, which is quite skewed, it's uh, very asymmetric, uh, and it has a mode of 0. If we go to 3 dice for n equals 3, and still p equals 1 6 and q equals 5 6, let's see what happens now. If we throw 3 dice, a lot of the time we don't get any 6s at all. Sometimes we get a 6 on one dice here on the white, and there we've got a 6 on the red. And there we've got two 6s, one on the red and one on the white. Of course, getting three 6s is less likely, but if we go on long enough, then on average about one time in 216 we'll be lucky enough to get sixes on all three dice. So now we see several possible outcomes. A failure on all three dice occurs with a probability of 5, 6 times 5, 6 times 5, 6, which is 0.578, and that is the probability of getting no sixes at all in our frequency in our probability distribution. We can get a single 6 in three different ways, either on the red, the green or the white die, and in each case that gives us a probability of 5 6 times 5 6 times 1 6, which is 0.115. So those three possibilities together add up to 0 0.35, and those are the ways in which we can get 1 6. So the probability of 1 6 is 0 0.35 in our probability distribution. Similarly, we can get two 6s in three different ways, either on the red and the green, the red and the white, or the green and the white. And in each case, the probability is 1 6 times 1 6 for the two successes, multiplied by 5 6 for the one failure, which gives 0 0.023. If we add those three up, that gives a total of 0 0.07. So that is the probability of getting two sixes in our probability distribution. Finally, three sixes occurs when we have a probability of one six for the red dice, one six for the green, and one six for the white, which multiplied together gives a probability of 0 0.005. So that is the probability of getting three sixes in our probability distribution. This is the binomial distribution for n equals 3 with p equals 0.17. Once again, it has a mode or most likely value of 0. Uh, this time the mean is 0 0.5, as you might expect uh, with three dice and a 1 6 probability, the average number of sixes is 0 0.5. 
If you work out the variance, it comes to 0.42, which means that the standard deviation is the square root of that, which is 0.65. If we go on to more dice, um, for n equals 6, 6 throws, and p equals 1, 6, and q equals 5, 6, we get the binomial distribution, which looks like this. It, now the mode has changed from 0 to 1, and with 6 dice, the mean is obviously going to be 1. On average, we get 1, 6 on, e uh, on each throw. The variance turns out to be 0.83, which means that the standard deviation is 0.91. If we go to 60 dice, then we get the binomial distribution for n equals 60 and p equals 0.17. Now the mode turns out to be 10, and the mean is also 10, and the distribution is now looking much more symmetric. It has a variance of 8.3 and a standard deviation of 2.9. If we were to try it with 600 dice, we'd find that the binomial distribution for n equals 600 and p equals 0.17 now looks nice and symmetric, and the mode is 100, and the mean is also 100, and the variance turns out to be 83, which means the standard deviation is 9.1. So if we summarise those dice results, we see that for n equals 1, the mode was 0, the mean was 0.17, and the variance was 0.14. For n equals 2, the mode was 0, the mean was 0.33, and the variance was 0.28. For n equals 3, the mode is still 0, the mean is 0.5, and the variance is 0.42. For n equals 6, the mode is 1, the mean is also 1, and the variance is 0.83. For n equals 60, the mode is 10, the mean is also 10, and the variance is 8.3. And for n equals 600, the mode is 100, the mean is 100, and the variance is 83. So you can see what's happening there. As n increases, the mode becomes equal to the mean. That's because the distribution becomes more and more symmetric. And you can see from this that the variance always it turns out to be 5 6 of the mean value. So to summarise the properties of the binomial distribution, we have a number of trials n, a probability of success p, and a probability of failure q, where p and q must add up to 1. Then the mean turns out to be n times p, that is the mean number of successes, and the variance is n times p times q, which is just the mean times q. The variance is therefore always going to be less than the mean, because q has to be less than 1. But in fact, if p is very small, then q becomes close to 1, so that the variance is only slightly less than the mean. And as the mean increases, the distribution becomes more and more symmetric. So those are the properties of the binomial, binomial distribution, and we'll see how those can be used in later examples. If you want to plot the binomial distribution yourself, then Excel has a function called binomdist, which will work out the binomial distribution for any value of n and p. So that brings us to the end of the second part on this lecture on probability distributions. In the next part, I'll look at the Poisson distribution.